And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to another episode of All the Above, the show that gives you an unstandardized take on education. I'm Jeffrey Garrett, one of your co-hosts, and I've been a middle and high school principal and a high school social studies teacher. And as always, I'm joined by... What up, family? It's Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. I'm a high school history teacher. I teach outside of Los Angeles, and this is my 17th year in the classroom. And this, of course, is all the above. Your home for news and analysis of all matters pertaining to our world of education. If you're watching this on YouTube or not, if you're listening to this on the go, either way, Happy New Year to you. I know you've probably heard that a million times over the last couple of days, but we just want to extend a very happy New Year's to all of y'all who are listening, who are watching this show. We hope this is a, a fantastic year for you, especially those of you who are in education, especially those of you who are, are working with our most marginalized populations and trying to help them recover from what was a very, very challenging 2020 for sure. All right, um, Jeff, man. New year, 2020 is behind us. Mm. How you feeling? How you feeling? Wow. Well, uh, <laughs> I tell you what, man. Well, um, 2020 is like just barely <laughs> behind us. Hey, man, it's so, behind us. That's I, what matters, man. We got I, through I it. I feel like uh, I feel like this is like when it's your birthday and people are like, what's it feel like to be 17? <laughs> and you're like, exactly like it did to be 16 yesterday. So I'm still I'm kind of in that mode on 2020. Like ain't nothing really changed um, thus far. But 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 I am hopeful that maybe there are some, you know, some good things on the horizon. Obviously, we'll have some big political change, uh, you know, coming our way. Um, fingers crossed, I guess. But, um, you know, but also just the, you know, obviously the possibility of a vaccine impacting, um, you know, our ability to conduct certain aspects of life in our society and around the world. Uh, you know, we're deep in winter, but, you know, spring is next, right? So um, maybe there is a, a, a season of rebirth approaching. So I am um, dealing with my lingering trauma and uh, cautiously optimistic. How about that? <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it for sure. Um, yeah. And those of you who are watching us, you know, if you're relatively new to our show, you know, maybe maybe one of your New Year's resolutions, if, if folks still do that, maybe one of yours was to find some dope podcasts or some dope shows on education to watch. And that yeah. brought you to us. And we just want to extend a warm welcome to all those all of those who may be listening or watching for the first time. And definitely, definitely, our show is one of those where the conversations that we have on here with our guests, they are important and they are what we call evergreen, meaning that even if it's an episode from a year and a half ago, that topic is still relevant. And you definitely want to go back and, and dig through the crates and, and re-explore, re-explore, explore some of those, some of those episodes, which, um, you know, have covered such, such important topics that, um, you know, you definitely don't want to miss any of that. So our website, aotashow.com has it all for you. So definitely you want to take some time exploring where we have been on this show. But, um, for today, Jeff, what's what's the agenda? Well, man, well, today we got a fascinating uh, conversation, fascinating subject, and one that, frankly, I think in this um, you know in this New Year's moment is maybe even more front and center on people's minds than it is typically. So we have an amazing guest coming on with us, who is a professor at uh, UC Riverside, um, Dr. Como, who is uh, going to going to talk to us about his expertise, which is around issues dealing with athletics, student athletes, and racial equity and justice, and kind of the intersection of those things. Um, and, you know, here we are, it's, it's New Year's. I mean, tens of millions of people across the country have either just recently been or are just about to, you know, watch uh, college football games. You know, the college basketball season has been, you know, moving along. Uh, you know, we're potentially coming up on March Madness or some version, you know, of that, right? And uh, we're in this moment where college athletics is big business and where the implications of COVID and health and safety of athletes are, are at stake. And just in general, these issues around, you know, how does the experience of college athletes 
uh, you know, play out at the higher education level where we very often, at least in the revenue generating sports, have young black men um, and women, but especially men in this case, um, who are, you know, unpaid laborers uh, making millions and millions of dollars for universities and coaches and that sort of thing. So, um, so Dr. Como is going to come on, talk to us about all of this stuff, help us understand it, um, and kind of maybe frame the issues of athletics in higher education and in K-12 education for that matter, and maybe a different light than we've, we've heard before. So it's going to be fascinating, a topic we have not talked about really on All the Above before. So it's a new year. Time for a new topic, so definitely stick around. You don't want to miss it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Dr. Eddie Como, he he was a, a, a pro baseball player, and now he's a university professor. I don't know how many university professors out there also play professional sports. I can't imagine there are a whole lot of them, so super dope. Again, on our show, we, we only bring on the dope guests. So you definitely, definitely want to uh, stay tuned for that, ep uh, for that segment, which is coming up in our seminar. But up next is our Do Now, where we like to take a look at recent headlines in the world of education. Stay tuned. All right, folks, now it's time for today's Do Now, where we take a look at recent headlines in the world of education. Jeff, how are we going to do this First do now of the year. Well, Manuel, it'd be only fitting uh, in this beginning of the second semester of the school year that we got to, you know, get a sense of where all the students are at, uh, do some pre-assessment. So with that in mind, we got a pop quiz. Pop quiz. Day one back and we're quizzing already. <laughs> ah, all right. Uh, you know, in, in the thoughtful, responsible sense of assessment, man. Well, nice. Low nice. stakes, low stakes. Cool. All right. So, Jeff, first pop quiz question. This is a interesting question here. Um, young man, could I have a, a look at your phone? <laughs> Am I in character here, Manuel? <laughs> I don't know. Is that Maybe. is that okay? So it's either the answer is you must be tripping, <laughs> hell no, or complete silence while I turn my back and walk away from you. <laughs> that is hilarious. Um, <laughs> that is hilarious. The the unfortunate answer in this case is that it doesn't matter if you want me to or not. I'm gonna get in there and I'm gonna have a look around. And this mm. story here is really a troubling story, I think related to schools purchasing technology that allows them to search through students' phones, even if those phones are locked and have encryption and, and all that good stuff meant to secure them. Um, really, really wild stuff here, Jeff. A, a wild story to start the new year for us, all right? So yeah. this story comes out of Gizmodo from some reporting from Tom McKay and Drew Metroda. Um, very sorry if I am mispronouncing your last name. Um, and in this in this story, they basically, they reviewed accounting documents across several school districts and found that more and more are purchasing controversial surveillance technology known as mobile device forensic tools or MDFTs. This technology is able to siphon text messages, photos, and application data from students' devices despite the device's own encryption and security measures, potentially exposing students to invasive cell phone searches. Originally developed for the military, this technology has been utilized by federal and local police for years. The fact that controversial equipment, that this controversial equipment is now available for school district employees to search students' personal devices has gone relatively unnoticed. And of course, this serves as a frightening reminder of how technology originally developed for use by the military or intelligence services keeps on trickling down to domestic police and even the institutions where our kids go to learn. This story mostly focuses on some districts in Texas, but our own district here, Los Angeles Unified School District, which is the second largest school district in the country, has one of these MDFT devices. And it says this device is used by a team that investigates complaints of employee misconduct against students. Its listed description for the job of, quote, digital forensics investigator states that those that, that those with this role assist with student safety issues, fraud, collusion, and or conflicts of interest. And of course, while search 
While searches without a warrant are generally considered unreasonable, the situation in schools is a little different. There's a lot more wiggle room there for administrators to search students so long as officials have a reasonable reasonable belief that a student has broken the law or school policy. Jeff, MDFTs. I know we are both, you know, trained history teachers and we're not really technologists here. So I don't know if you are familiar with these devices, but what is your response to this idea that schools across the country and districts across the country are purchasing these devices which break through encryption and allow school officials to search through students' cell phones? Yeah, man. Well, so <laughs> my first thought was like, oh, you know, how can this go wrong? Uh, <laughs> like, so... Honestly, this was a new story for me. I have not heard of or been a part of any conversations or seen a debate about this anywhere in education before. So, I, you know, this was a fascinating one to me. I mean, obviously, the issue of educators and a school system uh, asserting a right to uh, to conduct a search of student property or a locker or a backpack or, you know, something like that is, is a long established issue. Right. And, and just to like front load it for people, the United States Supreme Court, uh, you know, has has weighed in. And the reality is students have some protections, but not complete protections uh, that, you know, that you or I as an adult citizen in this country would have. Uh, as protection from from search and seizure uh, from the police, like in our home, right? right. So th the effective way to understand this is that schools have some custodial authority over over students. That's kind of quasi like a parenting role, and in that role, with you know a certain level of like reasonable um, you know reason to have suspicion, can search a student's uh, physical person, can search a student's backpack can search a student's locker, um, those sorts of things. Now, that's usually, uh, you know, or at least when acted upon ethically and responsibly, should be reserved for things like we think a student is selling drugs in the school um, or, you know, a student has brought a weapon to school um, or, you know, things like that, right? This is not a, this is not a punitive um, action that should be taken. It's really one that should be rooted in, in larger campus safety. This issue i you know so i have a lot of more questions about than perhaps actual judgments i will say the first thing that it really made me think about was like if we need to have these devices because in today's day and age when we do have the very small number of cases we have but they are there nationally where teachers are having inappropriate personal or sexual relationships with a student right that the the actual student may be you know being exploited or manipulated or in a position where they're unwilling to report on the teacher right um, on the perpetrator in this case and of course the teacher may you know uh in that case or the educator i should say in that case might uh take the same stance and so we might need a situation where district and or law enforcement could gain access to uh to, you know illicit text messages or those sorts of things so I see that, but I also am thinking like, well, that's a criminal, like, an, you know, a teacher having sex with a minor, like that's a criminal investigation. Yes, yeah, send that doesn't to the police. Law, right, doesn't law enforcement already have the tools to be able to get a warrant and, you know, and access a phone through the legal means of doing so? So it's unclear to me why a school district would need this unless what they were doing was getting into school district property, right? So like if you have put a password on your district phone or your district iPad nah. or something, right? And like they need to crack that to get into the district property, that's one thing. But it's unclear to me why we actually need this to access students cell phones like and, and honestly frankly just on like a practical level right if, if this had if i had been the student right and the district investigative arm came to my parents and said we have reason to believe a teacher's having an you know abusive relationship with your child we need to gain access to your child's phone like how many parents are going to be like nah you can't see the kid's phone right like right, right. the parents are going to be cooperative in these investigations i would assume the overwhelming majority of of times and so the use of this device might not even actually be necessary. I, you know, maybe I'm just not understanding it or not familiar enough with like the 
underbelly of these kinds of investigations to know. But it yeah. strikes me as like, why do we need it, actually? Yeah. Um, and given its potential for abuse, do we really need it the same way that school districts had purchased surplus military equipment, you know, uh, <laughs> under the Obama administration, right? Uh, like, why do we need an armored personnel carrier for school police? You know right, what I'm right. saying? Like, why do we need this? That those are the things I'm thinking about, Memo. What What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Same, same here. I'm, I'm. You know, the the article opens up with a case of a student who was involved in an inappropriate relationship with an educator, and the school district, by using the device, wasn't able just to see that phone's text messages, but it was able to pull deleted text messages which yeah, I didn't know that was a thing, but so yeah, I guess it could pull deleted messages and that's where they found evidence about this relationship. But to me, if there's any questions about something that's that serious, it just seems like that should go straight to law enforcement. It seems that the district shouldn't be the one with this device, but maybe law enforcement, if if anybody. So yeah, that's, that's my question. Like if the only reason this device should be needed is if there's something that is so serious that you are taking it there that you are going to go ahead and scour through a, a student's cell phone, which has any number of things on it that are not for our eyes. But if it's that serious, it should go to law enforcement, it seems like, you know? So it's it's really troubling to me that a school district would have this. I, I'm trying to envision the conversation where a district or a team of school officials decides to use this device um, on a student's cell phone. And I'm trying to picture like where in that conversation is the educator that says, you know what, if it's this serious, we should we should go to our local law enforcement and proceed there or something along those lines. And if it's a, you know, to your point, if it's a district phone that they have to break, break into, I don't know. Again, I'm not a technologist, but I would assume any district devices already have controls in place so that it can't get to a level where the district can't get into their own device because a teacher or an administrator set up a certain password. I don't know. It just seems like something this serious shouldn't be in the hands of school officials. My overall concern is these, this ongoing need to have serious conversations about student privacy because more and more, especially in this pandemic, more and more of what students are doing um, at school is, is through technology. And they are more than ever being exposed to the potential for their information, their their personal data to end up in the hands of technology companies and end up in the hands of others. And you know that student's gonna grow up one day and regret that paper that they wrote in the 10th grade or regret that internet search that they did as part of this research project in science class. And what safeguards are there that this data isn't going to end up in the wrong hands in the future and, and hurt the kids later on. So yeah, I think there need to be really big conversations about student privacy and, Part of those conversations, I think, need to include educating students and parents about stuff like this, because I've never heard of any of this. You hadn't heard of this. We both are reasonably well read in the in you know in the area of education and what's going on in in our schools because of course we we produce the show and we bring folks the latest in, <laughs> in news and headlines around the world of education. And this is new to us. So, you know, if a official approaches a parent and says, you know what? Um, it's possible maybe that um, your child has been hanging out with their assistant basketball coach and we just want to make sure that nothing inappropriate is going on. Do we mind if we um, do you mind if we look at your student's phone and the parent probably to your point will be like, yeah, I'm more than willing to help out because they, of course, also want to know if their student has been um, part of something that that is unseemly. And then they hand it to the official and the official like plugs it into this device and now they can see everything and like what happens when they see stuff that you know teenagers do and that wasn't part of this original investigation but also is something that's you know a violation of school policy or something like you know that slippery slope is slippery as hell and i just think more people need to be talking about technology that schools are purchasing to dig deeper into student um digital spaces yeah yeah, and that's such an excellent point because especially, you know, since we've been in full distance learning um, or even in hybrid learning where almost every aspect of school right now is taking place via some type of device for young people. And those devices are overwhelmingly, uh, you know, sucking data up from kids that is either owned by Google 
that is owned by Apple or that is owned by Microsoft, right? And there's probably dozens of other corporations involved in this equation as well. But when we just think about the number of Chromebooks, iPads, right? Um, the amount of usage of Microsoft software, um, you know, on these devices, the, the level of data extraction that is currently taking place and is frankly taking place in a mostly unregulated way uh, right now, um, apart from like student grades and actual student identifying information uh, is staggering, right? Um, and certainly the laws have not caught up with uh, the, the technology right now. But I, I, I will say, Manuel, there's one thing that comes to mind that like maybe explains this and I, I wanna give a little bit of voice to, right? So like the, you reminded me there of the recovery of deleted messages. And so I was, I think I was focusing more on the issue of like consent to search the device, right? Which mm -hmm. is obviously a huge issue. But in the event that let's say, you know, a parent says, oh my God, there's, you know, we think there's something inappropriate going on here and they bring the concern to the school and now the school wants to search the device um, and they have permission to, but they can't access deleted stuff. I could see this being an important forensic, like investigative tool in that sense in two ways. One, because it can help you recover things that you know that you can't just see from getting the password and looking around the phone. And two, there is some reason that we want schools and districts to be able to, to investigate things in a uh, non-criminal fashion, right? So that we're not immediately rushing police into schools, particularly when we don't really know what happened yet. Right? right. So like there is some importance in like schools and school districts conducting investigations. And if there is something that is egregious or criminal that invo that should involve the police, then we involve the police. Right. Um, so, you know, I think that is actually an, a helpful safeguard in some ways in the system to not like over police what happens yeah. in schools or over criminalize the youth in that way. So maybe there is a like actually a, a more righteous reason for this to exist than I was originally thinking. There but could be. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna need to see some proof that yes. that's how it's being used <laughs> and that's only how it's being used yes. in order to be like, this is some Gestapo craziness and we need to get it out of our schools immediately. For sure, if any of our AOTA family members who are watching this or listening have any added context about these devices, definitely share that with us because I, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm definitely suspicious of this. It's not sounding good, but you are right. There are definitely reasons to try to keep something in-house and not immediately go to the police about, about just every little suspicion that you might have. So yeah. Yeah. All right, Jeff, next quiz question for today. What we got? All right, man. Well, next up, we have the question, what is good for you but many people avoid it like the plague. Hmm. This is an easy one, Jeff. Brussels sprouts. I can't stand <laughs> Brussels sprouts. I'm told that oh, they man. have some nutritional value. I don't know, antioxidants or something. I could be way wrong about that. Now, but no, you... I'm just, I'm not a Brussels sprouts person. My wife has tried wow. to make them in various ways that people love. And they, wow. I'm just not, I'm, I'm a picky eater, man. And I'm okay. cool, man. I, I just don't need them in my life. I'm all right. You know, I, here's the thing. I have a theory about Brussels sprouts. There's a certain set of foods that are just like genetically nasty to you until you are an adult. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is like earthy and delicious. And I feel like Brussels sprouts are one of those foods, man. Like you, we just got to get you some good Brussels sprouts, man. Them, I them have could been, be the bomb, dude. <laughs> I'm, you sound like my wife. She has said the same yeah. thing. And she has on many occasions, you know, made them for herself and ordered them at restaurants and in various forms. And yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. All right. Well, next time she makes them, just uh, just make me a plate, man. I'll, yeah, I know, right? Uh, I'll, I'll take <laughs> for yours, <sure>. okay? <laughs> um, well, man, well, that is a thoughtful answer, if uh, perhaps crazy. Um, but, <laughs> but I will say it is not the correct answer. The correct answer, Manuel, is, uh, is vaccines. Or in this case, a uh, soon-to-be-ready-for-mass-distribution uh, set of COVID-19 vaccines. Now... This story uh, comes to us by uh, Ariana Protero um, from Education Week and is a fascinating account uh, of a major question that is, uh, that is already on folks' minds and is about to become you know, the next big controversial thing everyone's thinking about, which is, 
Should schools be in the business of requiring students to take the COVID-19 vaccine or a COVID-19 vaccine in order to return to schools? So let's dig into this. Um, uh, public polling uh, recently and over the last several months has shown that large swaths of the public are hesitant about getting a newly developed vaccine. Only 58% of American adults said in a Gallup poll released in November that they would get a COVID-19 vaccine. So we're talking about more than four in 10 people um, are, are saying no. The most common reason cited for not wanting to get a vaccine was the speed at which it was developed. Now, among educators, the data is a little bit different. 44% uh, of educators indicated in a recent Ed Week research center poll that they were very likely to get a COVID-19 vaccine once it's available. So, uh, you know, that means perhaps educators are a little less likely uh, to want to uh, be vaccinated um, than the general public. Um, of course, another 27% said they were somewhat likely. Now, all 50 states in the country do require vaccines of one form or another um, tip, uh, for students to attend school. And these are typically for diseases like uh, polio, measles, tetanus, et cetera, right? I think we've all probably remembered this uh, from our, child and, and our childhood in one form or another. However, uh, most states allow families to opt out of getting their children vaccinated for either religious or personal reasons. Some state officials are already making public statements about their intentions uh, on this matter. For example, Tennessee Governor Bill Lee said in a recent press conference that the COVID-19 vaccine will be optional for kids attending schools. Pennsylvania's sec uh, health secretary has said the state will not require students to get the vaccine, um, according to reports in local media. There are still very important questions to be answered about the vaccine, such as how long it will protect people, how effective it will be in children. Of course, the testing, as I understand it, uh, that's been done thus far has been done on adults and, on, and not on children, um, and whether there might be rare or long-term side effects that haven't cropped up in clinical trials, which of course just began over the summer. So, Manuel, uh, as an educator, as a teacher who's probably been in the situation where, you know, in the first couple weeks of school, you have a kid who hasn't shown up yet because they haven't gotten their, you know, their measles uh, vaccine booster or whatever it is. Um, what's your take on this uh, very complicated question? Yeah, well, we got to be careful how we talk about this, Jeff, because our show does go on YouTube and we don't want to attract mm. the crazies around this topic of <laughs> vaccines and stuff, man. Oh, um, yeah, they're coming. They're coming. <laughs> for sure. So, yeah, I mean, I get it. I get it. There's reason to be suspicious, obviously, because it was rushed and our, our um, former president definitely didn't do a, a, a good job at all at instilling confidence in this vaccine, the way he tweeted about it and the way he, he pushed and, and threatened that the FDA administrator better you know approve it and, and all that. So there's reason to be suspicious, of course. And I just get the sense, like just as an educator, if schools try to require this vaccine that the pushback is going to be going to be wild, and the pushback might do more harm than good. So, just being realistic here, going back to school and trying to fully transition out of pandemic teaching and learning towards a post-pandemic education world, it's going to have to happen in phases. You know, we're not just going to just magically like everybody shows back up and everything's normal. So, part of that planning of these phases should probably include those whose children do get the vaccine are the ones who are first welcomed back to campus. And if you don't want your child to get the vaccine, perhaps you or your child is, is one of those phases that has to wait a little while as we slowly transition back to full in-person, everybody in-person type of learning. Um, I, don't, I don't really see any other solution here. I think if we require it, it's going to be um, just a, a hell of a mess. You're going to see all the usual crazy protesters out there in front of schools this time, in front of district offices this time. And, you know, it's, it's just not going to really do much, much good in terms of helping us get to a world where everybody actually trusts this vaccine and, and what have you. So my, my 
take on it right now, at least, is that those whose uh, families want their children to get the vaccine and they get the vaccine, they get first priority to get back to in-person learning. And they're part of the first phase or two of transitioning back to in-person learning. And those who are skeptical and want to wait, all right, you can wait, but your kid is still distance learning until um, until we deem it safe enough. And, and once we do have a situation where all kids are back on campus and some of those kids are not vaccinated, those, those families have to basically take the responsibility for their kid continuing to get tested. You know, COVID testing should definitely remain. And if there's anybody in that household, yes. household who tests positive, that kid got to stay home. That kid got to stay home for sure. So all those all those protections that we are currently trying to do in certain countries and in certain certain areas for for rapid testing and and isolating cases and contract tra- all that, all that contact uh, tracing and all that, keep that in place. And those who don't want who don't want the vaccine who want to avoid it, all right. But you are doing that at the risk of your kid having to stay home, distance learning, because we're not going to allow um, your child to expose everybody else who who went ahead and did get the vaccine. So that's where my yeah. thinking is right now. I'm sure my 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 thoughts will change as each headline comes out and as each uh, piece of data comes out. But that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, I you know I think what you're saying there is very reasonable. Makes lots and lots of sense. And uh, I think the reality is we don't have to get to this space where what we have is a mandate and then the anti-vaxxer crowd starts going crazy and the like deep orthodox religious crowd starts talk, you know, crying about the First Amendment. Um, and, I, you know, I don't say that necessarily to dismiss those folks claims. Right. But uh, but to say we don't have to get to that place. Right. I think what we could do is educate people, right? Yeah. <laughs> what we could do is be radically transparent with data about what we know about the vaccine and what we don't know about the vaccine. And the fact of the matter is, this has been a very speedily rushed process, okay? That's the truth. This is the fastest we've ever uh, you know, uh, developed a vaccine and pushed it to market that is a new vaccine, right? And there is an obvious potential for unknown causes and, you know, unknown effects of that vaccine as a result, even if we think that potential is very small, right? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean there is a boogeyman out there who's trying to kill you with a vaccine, right? And so I think the way that we uh, that we address people's concerns, particularly the legitimate concerns that are not just like the folks who deny science and like vaccines are fake, you know, fake news, right? Like I'm not worried about those folks in particular, right? What I am saying is like all the other people who are like, I don't know, man, like Pfizer and Donald Trump developed something and you want me to stick it in my child's arm? Like, <laughs> I'll, I'll let me go to the back of the line and wait and see what happens to these other people. Like that's a totally reasonable take to have right now. Um, you know, even if you believe that the science is good, right? But so we need to educate people about the science. We need to tell people like, here's what happened with all the folks in the, you know, in the studies. And here's the people who, you know, developed uh, some immunity. And here's what we know about how long that immunity lasts or, you know, what that means in terms of spread of the, you know, of the disease in your household or what we just plain don't know yet. Like we don't know how long the immunity lasts because we've only been testing these vaccines for like four months. Okay, so (laughs) so, uh, you know, we've got to be honest with people about that. It's the hoarding of information and the the wanting to put a pretty face on it that tells people everything's fine. Just take the vaccine. Look, LeBron is going to take the vaccine. Like, I don't think that's going to make any difference for folks. I think what we need is to educate people about why we think this is good, what we what we know and don't know, what the potential risks are, but why we are recommending it. Right. Um, and treat people like intelligent adults who deserve a good, honest, thoughtful answer, right? And so um, what I found really fascinating in this article is they gave an example um, of a recent developed vaccine where the where we took the approach of let's mandate this for, for kids in schools, which is the HPV vaccine that we give to young girls, right? To like 13-ish year old girls. Right um, now, HPV is a virus that um, winds up causing, I believe, uh, like cervical cancer um, in women, and we can vaccinate against it. 
uh, doctors really jumped behind this and said this is a great thing. And some um, states and school systems started mandating that young girls get it, which is coming from a good place. But what happened is parents started pushing back against it because they're like, I don't know what this is. This is new. Is it tested? And that makes room for some of the conspiracy theory about vaccines, which is totally unhelpful. Right. And so um, and we're still dealing with that resistance to the HPV vaccine today, even though this was rolled out, you know, five, six years ago or whenever it was. So, you know, the, I think the reality is we got to think big picture here. What we want is immunity, broad immunity in the community so that we prevent community spread and so that the vulnerable people in our society who cannot be vaccinated are protected because the disease cannot spread within the community. And if we want to get there, we got to think about strategy and what's the best strategy. I personally don't think that right now mandating in schools is the best strategy. I think we go hard on education, public education uh, as a campaign. And then, you know, maybe a year or two down the road and we have a lot more data about, you know, like confirmation of safety and we have a lot more data about longevity of the vaccine and like what it what is what this means after multiple flu seasons and that sort of stuff. Then maybe we move to a mandate and say, like, look, man, if you want to be an anti-vaxxer, like then you got to stay home or you can join the rest of society and like get this vaccine. So that's that's where I am with it, man. All right. <clears throat> Education campaign. Good luck with that. Because to go back to my Brussels sprouts um, discussion earlier, I have been told many times that Brussels sprouts are delicious and <laughs> that they, you know, are uh. overall good. And I'm still not interested. I'll, I'll pass. I'll pass. <laughs> hard, but you're right. Hard I, pass I agree. We need to educate Russell. folks and not, not pressure folks and not push folks to have to get it because that that's not going to go well. So yeah. yeah. All right. We will see where this goes. Uh, another interesting conversation to be had, not right now, but at some point is um, the teacher side of this, you know, uh, mm, should teachers yes. be required to, should that be part of the MOUs with, with unions or not? Nah? And if a teacher opts not to get the vaccine, are they allowed to report back to work? And if so, and you know, something happens with them, are there any protections for them or did they, did they waive their possible protection. So yeah. lots to discuss there for sure. But that, that'll be for another day. Yeah. All right, folks, that about does it for today's Do Now. Up next, we will have Dr. Eddie Como here with us to discuss college athletics and the intersections between college sports and justice, especially in the midst of the pandemic. Stay tuned. Hey folks, thanks for watching all the above. We really appreciate you and we need your help. We're trying to get the word out about all the above to everyone. Here's what you can do. Go to aotashow.com, that's our website. All the links to all of our content is there. You can share our stuff on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. Send the links to friends, colleagues, educators you know who could benefit from this type of show. Help us spread the word about all the above. Thanks, enjoy the show. All right, folks, welcome to today's seminar. Today we are going to be discussing the, the intersections between college athletics and justice and racial justice, uh, specifically in the midst of this pandemic. And we have a, a fantastic, super dope guest with us. Of course, we only bring you the, the dope guests, the dope educators. And uh, today we have Dr. Eddie Como out of UC Riverside. Dr. Como, thank you so much. Welcome to all of the above. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um, for folks who aren't already familiar with Dr. Como's work, let me let me tell you a little bit about him. So Dr. Eddie Como serves as Associate Professor of Higher Education and is the founding executive director of the Center for Athletes Rights and Equity at the University of California, Riverside. Shout out to the uh, Highlanders, I believe it is. Highlanders. Central to his work are issues of racial equity and policy, and his research examines the college student experience with special attention on athletes and underrepresented students. Dr. Como has authored numerous peer-reviewed articles and published several books, including Introduction to Intercollegiate Athletics, Making the Connection, 
data-informed practices in academic support centers for college athletes, and College Athletes' Rights and Well-Being, Critical Perspectives on Policy and Practice. Dr. Como is currently working on his next book, which is titled Organized Captivity, Control, Hypersurveillance, and Disposability of Black Athletes in the Corporate University. Man, that is a title. I know you're hitting them hard with that one. I can't wait to, to read that one. <laughs> uh, so, Dr. Como, welcome to our show. I believe uh, Jeffrey has our first question for you. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Como, for joining us today. And I um, want to jump in with a question that I know lots of, uh, of K-12 educators across the country uh, think about and maybe one of the most common ways that, that we intersect with the kind of world of college athletics even if we don't always actually intersect with it, which is which is through our students. And I think we've all had students who, you know, dreamed of, you know, going division one and, you know, playing uh, big time you know, basketball or football or other other college sports and and kind of taking that important next step forward on their on their path to the pros. And um, and so in as much as that is like both a, a fun and great thing for like a kid to dream about, um, you know, I think we all have that sort of like educator. Well, you got to, you know, have plan B together sort of speech uh, we give to kids. But very curious, uh, a person of your um, you know, experience, having been a professional athlete um, and being a professor of higher education and really studying this issue, what do you see as some of the challenges with young people, with parents, with educators thinking of, you know, of college and college sports in that way? Right. That's, that, that, that's a beautiful question. And as I think about the student, there, there is a personal responsibility uh, on the part of the student who participates in athletics at the high school level. And, and as much as they, there's a responsibility to be accountable for, you know, their day-to-day -day engagement within the classroom and elsewhere, I also really think about the structural arrangement. In many ways, you know, college students who participate in athletics, I want them to fulfill their dreams. If playing professional sports uh, is an aspiration, uh, let's try to work toward that together. And so uh, as much as um, I want to encourage and support that sort of endeavor and that process, I'm also thinking about the structure, right? Uh, we need to acknowledge as educators, as family members, as mentors, as coaches, as those who are invested in the well-beings of students who participate in athletics, for example, at the high school level, is that all students are, are capable of performing well academically and elsewhere under the right conditions, right? And so we as teachers, we as educators, we need to be razor sharp in terms of providing those conditions free of hostility, you know, to, to, to the fullest extent possible, ensuring that anti-blackness is not overwhelming them in their classes, creating those learning structures that students can do both be both students and athletes, right? My mentor once said that students need to learn to dream with their eyes open. And part of that is being, you know, mindful of their trajectory, but also understanding that you can have a strong academic prowess. You can compete with passion in the classroom and you can do both, but it requires togetherness. It, it, can, it, it requires a community um, that, that is really shaping those experiences, those pathways, those equitable pathways uh, for those students, particularly for the most vulnerable who tend to be black and brown. Yeah, and you've been writing about and, and, and conducting research on the college athlete experience for, for quite a while before even this, this summer's reckoning for racial justice. So I think during the events of this summer, more people started to pay attention to racial um, disparities within the experiences of college athletes and how we talk about college athletes. And, you know, I'm, I'm a UCLA Bruin. That's where I, I graduated from. So I root for the Bruins. And this, this year, their football team wore a patch that, that had fists up in the air and, and supported Black Lives Matter. And you wrote a piece about sort of the intersection between college sports and this uh, national reckoning for racial justice. And I, I want to read a, a quote from that piece and, and ask you a little bit about it. So uh, the piece was titled Five Ways to Advance Racial Justice in College Sports. And you wrote that, quote, the NCAA and its member institutions have an obligation to go beyond hollow performative statements and commit 
wholeheartedly to an agenda that understands organizational problems in radically different ways and that advances racial equity and justice in practical and thoughtful ways. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you envision this agenda looking like for the NCAA and its member institutions. Right. You know, this this article is really motivated by the statements of solidarity of unity from many organizations that that popped up after the, the George Floyd murder, including Ben and Jerry's, uh, Kohan, Nike and NCA and its member institution, uh, which is, the, you know, NCA, the governing body of, of college athletics. And what I re really was attempting to highlight is the fact that the NCAA, while they may acknowledge in their public statements that Black Lives Matter, you know, after the murder of George Floyd, there wasn't any clear substantive, substantive uh, steps uh, that must be taken uh, going forward. And so I really wanted to kind of spotlight the NCA and member institutions that, that, you know, we see you, we see that you're acknowledging, you know, um, you know, this public execution and understanding that black lives do matter. Um, this has been going on for decades upon decades. Um, but, but at the same time, what are some practical ways in which we can kind of move the needle? You know, what does equity and justice really look like in practice, right? And so oftentimes I say we need to kind of redefine what we mean by equity, what we mean by justice, because simply coming out and saying that, that we support you is not enough. These really can become performative statements. And so I really want to acknowledge in practical ways what that might look like. And I sort of laid out outline five ways that the NCAA and member institutions can actively advance racial equity in college sports. And, and the first and foremost, right, that whether we're at the high school level or at the college level or elsewhere, is really to understand Black ontological and physiological existence. Uh, too often, we have not acknowledged that all bodies are not equally at risk. Too often, Black people are viewed as subhuman, as inferior, as property, as less than you know, and really seen as exploitable or expendable commodities. And so uh, the first you know, thing that I wanted to highlight is, you know, how are we acknowledging, uh, engaging with Black people, Black bodies, including athletes, really understanding their histories, their Blackness, and what it means to be fully human. Um, and so to, to really think about that at the high school level, to really think about that at the college level, hopefully will stimulate some conversations around the ways in which you know, black people have been treated and how they are protected in, in these spaces. And so that was really what I was trying to get at. And so so one just simply being acknowledging, you know, black humanity um, and, and then, of course, thinking about what that might look like in practice, whether it's in the form of uh, facilitating intergroup dialogue and fostering sort of cross uh, cultural understanding of, of the different types of anti-blackness, structural forms of uh, anti-blackness that plays out on campus that, that oftentimes people are, are not even aware of in terms of how they're treating, um, how they might be sort of displaced on a campus. You know, the sort of racial microaggressions that, you know, the sort of su subtle forms of gestures um, that play out, uh, you know, in the broader academic community with, you know, with, with black athletes. You know, also thinking and acknowledging that, you know, black uh, athletes are not educationally reimbursed. And so to really think about how do we better prepare, how do we better position Black athletes for life after sport, right? Um, are we engaging them in purposeful activities, uh, faculty projects with research, uh, with, with researchers, engaging them in internship opportunities, exposing them to those in uh, businesses, uh, those within the community that can start to prepare them and to really get them to think about life once the music stops playing. I'm also thinking um, about the way in which we uh, compensate athletes. You know, we don't do a good job of fairly compensating uh, athletes who are dis black athletes who are disproportionately in football uh, and men's basketball, right? And thinking about how we might you know, reward them for for their labor. Um, and of course, you know, I can go on and on um, with with other ideas um, that I think are very pragmatic that, that can be introduced at, at, in any domain. Um, and so I think this is really uh, to be begin to strike up a conversation about how we might kind of move this forward. Because as much as we talk about sort of the empty rhetoric of, yes, I believe that Black Lives Matter, what are we doing? What is the action plan? And, and how closely are we defining 
and thinking about equity and are we thinking about justice? Because simply putting out a statement is not justice. Uh, it's a process that perhaps could lead, lead us in that direction. Yeah, there's so much you shared there, um, Dr. Como, to, to unpack. And, and I would actually like to explore a couple of angles on this a little more deeply with you. Uh, one is just on a personal level, as a former college athlete myself, um, having been a, you know, a college football player, um, you know, I, I, I'm 40 years old. I still have some aches and pains that are uh, 100% for sure the results um, or connected at least uh, substantially to the result of my playing days, you know, uh, uh, including college football. And, uh, you know, and I know I'm not alone, right? There are, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of folks across the country uh, with similar situations. And of course, uh, you know, neither the institution that I attended nor the NCAA uh, are making any of my co-payments when I go to see my, uh, you know, <laughs> orthopedist uh, to talk about what I'm doing with my ankle and my knee. So, um, you know, I, I think there's like just some uh, some fascinating issues here, particularly as, as you're mentioning, you know, the, the concentration of wealth generation uh, in college sports that that relies upon the unpaid labor of black athletes and very often black male athletes in the case, you know, especially in the case of those two sports. In this universe where, you know, amateurism is, held, is always held up as like the thing we're all about. But meanwhile, the NCAA is signing, you know, multi-billion dollar television contracts to broadcast March Madness. And, um, you know, the uh, coaches around the country, uh, you know, in, in football are making millions and millions of dollars a year, uh, not only from their actual job of coaching, but through camps and endorsements. Uh, and players are getting suspended for taking a few bucks on the side, you know, to get some pizza money and that sort of thing. So I'm wondering if you can actually like unpack the these connections here uh, a little bit more for us. And I love that phrase you used of like uh, educational reimbursement, I think it was, uh, or something to that effect. Um, and like why that matters so much for black st college students and athletes. Right. That, that, that's another great question. And, you know, I found too er, early on, Jeffrey, that, you know, outside of, you know, participating in sport, there are other professions out there that better protect you, that are better on your body, better on your mind, uh, allow you to negotiate your time a lot better than playing college sports. So, so I am one who appreciated my time uh, as a college athlete, but also understand there are other areas in which you can pursue that, that might provide you a little bit more uh, freedom, uh, flexibility, and protection uh, for the labor uh, that you do. And so, you know, the question around, you know, uh, compensation for athletes, you know, you know, one of the misconceptions about college athletes is that they're not being paid. Uh, they're, they're actually being paid if you're on scholarship. You get a stipend every month. My, my concern is that they're not being fairly compensated for their labor. Right. And there are many in this structural arrangement of college athletics who benefit quite handsomely from this arrangement. You mentioned college coaches, you know, you know, you, know, you have football coaches that are making upwards of $10 million a year. The average, you know, a salary for basketball coaches in the power five is about $3 million, all off the backs of disproportionately black athletes who are oftentimes seen as property. Right. And I can speak to that more in a second here. But but no, I think that, you know, there's been a number of 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 movements that have played out uh, over the years, whether it's the um, the Northwestern case with the football players where they were trying to bargain collectively. You know, you had a more recent case here uh, with NIL in California where they're pushing to allow athletes to be mon to be able to monetize for their name, image and likeness. And, and, and too often. You know, those who are making the rules uh, tend to benefit the most from that. You know, athletes in the Power Five have about 4% of their voices being heard in a lot of these decision-making processes. And so it's, it's not playing out. It's not a fair uh, process in which we see uh, uh, playing out here. And it's, it's too often because of the so-called amateurism uh, that's being placed on athletics. And amateurism is supposed to be defined as Athletes are simply playing sport as an avocation. It's simply a hobby, right? But when you're talking about a multi-million dollar industry and everyone is benefiting from this enterprise except the athlete, 
there's something wrong with that problem, this, this, this structure, to say the least. And, and so as much as people also make the argument, well, athletes, you know, are getting an education. Well, some would even say a free education. And I say, you know, no, there's nothing free about putting your life on the line, uh, putting your body on the line, um, and actually uh, um, uh, putting yourself in a position where, you know, you could be uh, expendable, right? Um, and exploit it, right? There's nothing free about that. And so um, I'd like to see a structure that moves us in a direction that fairly compensates them for their education, that fairly compensates them financially for their labor, but also medically. You know, athletes are not guaranteed uh, to have their medical benefits paid for um, in, a, in the event of an injury. And if it becomes a chronic injury, and you no longer have eligibility, there's likely no chance that the university that committed to you uh, to ensure that there were 60 to 70,000 members um, at, on a football state, uh, stadium uh, supporting you, generating revenue streams for you, there's no guarantee that they're going to uh, take care of your out-of-pocket costs. And so there's something wrong with this structural arrangement that disproportionately impacts the most vulnerable folks who are actually producing and developing the actual product. Yeah, and I love what you said there about this, the the notion that they are getting a free tuition and that college is free for them. And definitely nothing free about putting your body out there, putting your life on the line, as you said. And of course, the lingering the lingering impact on, on folks' bodies. And that's not even to mention the fact that such a, a small percentage go on to the pros to become, you know, multimillionaires or what have you. So um, absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm a high school teacher. A lot of my students, a lot of them are student athletes. And, and the high school that I, that I teach at, John Muir High School, has a, a long history of, of, of student athletes going all the way back to, to Jackie Robinson, actually. And, you know, a lot of them right now in the midst of this pandemic, a lot of my students right now, they're really itching to get back on the field. You know, I have some students who are, um, you know, on their way to, to um, D1 universities. I have one that's on their way to Texas and one that, that chose USC, unfortunately, for uh, football. And, you know, they're itching to get back out there on the field. A lot of parents are saying like, yo, let them play, let them play. And California is, is still continuing to, to push back the start date of, of college sports. So uh, we're wondering if you could share with us, what are your, your, your views of how the pandemic is impacting, impacting uh, student athletes? And, and what would you say to these, these parents and a lot of these coaches out here that are like rushing to get kids back on the field? Right, well, well first of all, you know, you know, my, my condolences to any family uh, members who have lost uh, anyone due to the pandemic. This is clearly um, a major crisis that, that we haven't been able to, 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 to manage as well as we could have. There's clearly no, no vaccine. Uh, per, sounds like one is in order. Um, and we really haven't done a good job, uh, particularly uh, of, of supporting uh, our most vulnerable population, particularly black and brown. And we clearly know that that this is all um, aligned with structural racism um, that has played out uh, for some time now. And so that's, that, that's first and foremost. You know, you know, second, you know, a lot of high school uh, elite athletes who are uh, pursuing uh, the next level of college, I think, you know, my, my first advice was be to look at the data. Look at the schools who, who, who you're interested in and see how well they are meaningfully responding to this current public health crisis. You know, right now, you know, if you look at football specifically, you know, uh, it, it really speaks to the point I'm making about anti-Blackness and, and, and athletes not being seen as fully human. Um, ra rather, they're being seen as property, right? They, they, they are exploited, they are expendable, right? Uh, once they no longer um, uh, can produce uh, on the field. And so, um, I've been encouraged by, by some schools, uh, some coaches, some leaders uh, that have come out and said that, you know what, we're, we're not going to play anymore. Uh, this is too much. Uh, the most recent data that I believe surveyed uh, 78 of 130 uh, FBS schools and found that there's over you know, 6,000 uh, athletes and employees that have contracted the virus, right? For what? Like, like, like for what? Why, why are we engaging uh, and something as if it's this, as if athletes are essential workers, right? That in order for us to exist 
on a college campus that we need disproportionately black and brown bodies to perform for you. For what, right? We already talked about how they are not benefiting from this um, um, financially. Um, they're not, you know, sort of uh, engaging them in the way they should be in the classroom and helping them to sort of strike this healthy balance between the, their academics and athletics. And so, you know, but I also want to put out there that as much as we think about, well, athletes can just say we don't want to play. Athletes can just boycott, right? Like, like, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Because we talked about earlier how, you know, those athletes who aspire to play at the professional level, right? Um, many of these athletes could be first generation athletes, college students, they could be low income students, and they're thinking about the bigger picture. Yes, I can take a calculated risk of going out there during a pandemic, but I'm also betting on myself that one, I won't get sick, um, I'll stay healthy, and I'll eventually sign a contract that will um, support my family um, and something that I've been aspiring to do, right? And so as much as we wanna put the onus on athletes, well, why can't you just boycott? Why can't you just stop playing? The responsibility needs to be on those who are actually encouraging and requiring and mandating that we continue with football, irrespective of the current condition. So if we can place the pressure on those who are actually making the rules and benefiting financially from that, then I think it's a different article. Uh, different, it's a different situation. It's a different framing of an issue that has clearly uh, been, been very problematic to say the least. And so, you know, if I say anything, look at the data, look at how schools are responding to this, uh, ensure that you have an opportunity to opt out, right? If you don't feel as if um, you're protected fully, right? You might have an underlying condition, asthma, that makes you more susceptible, even at 17 or 18 years old. So you should be able to opt out. That, that should be in writing. You shouldn't jeopardize your athletic scholarship if you decide to say, no, I'm not playing. I'm not risking uh, my career. So those are the kinds of things that I would be talking to uh, those, who, those who are college bound that are thinking about playing at, at, the, at the next level. It's to really be thoughtful in that. And if you have any leverage, um, in terms of your athletic prowess where you can kind of negotiate what that might look like. That's always important as well. But, but talking to those who are in that space, talking to, to those who have studied that, that, talking to parents, talking to mentors is always the best way uh, to be able to make that sound decision. But, but you know, I, I'm a little disturbed uh, by, by how, you know, uh, you know, my former school, Cal, they canceled their first two uh, football games because of, of of those who had contract contracted the virus and they didn't have enough you know scholarship players to actually even play. Um, you know, again, what example are we presenting here, and 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 what is the reason that we feel that even during a time where campuses aren't open and non-athlete students are not on campus, they're engaged in remote instructions, yet a physical sport a sport where you're interacting, there's no physical distancing, yet you're still saying that we want you to play. To me, that sounds like an employee. To me, that sounds like a worker. To me, that sounds like somebody who needs to be better compensated or we need to reimagine what exactly we're engaging in at this point. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm so glad you're you're naming that, uh, Dr. Como. And I, you know, I often um, think about this issue through the lens of, of football just because of my personal experience. But uh, recently was watching a men's college basketball game. I think it was uh, I think it was Indiana and Florida State were playing. And, um, you know, it was an entertaining game to watch, but it went into overtime. And uh, I just had this sort of like sickening thought where I was like, here, here, you know, football is dangerous in all the ways you just described, but at least it's primarily played outdoors, right? Um, and, and for a sizable slice of players, there's, there's a fair amount of distance between them and other players for a good chunk of the time that they're, that they're on the field, certainly not all of it. But basketball is played on a much smaller court. It's played indoors. And these athletes are playing multiple games a week against different teams from different schools and different cities, right? And travel uh, demands and those sorts of things. So, um, and here they are being asked to not only play the full game, but then stay around on the court and play more of the game, right? Um, and that kind of stuff just, you know, just hit me in a, in a brand new way, the level of risk that, that even simple stuff like overtime 
uh, you know, may carry with it in a way that we've never had to think about before. Um, so I, I really appreciate your, your words and speaking to this. Um, I think our, our last question for you today, uh, Dr. Como, um, gets to an issue that you've written about uh, recently in this, this kind of idea and concept of black student athletes being engaged in this sort of enterprise of campus making. And I'm wondering if you can um, walk us through you know, what that means and why campus making is important for black students, especially in the context that many of us find ourselves, which is at predominantly white institutions. Right, and so, so you know, as someone who studies higher education, I'm constantly trying to think about one, how are our black students, how are racially minoritized students navigating a space that too often doesn't have the capacity to really love them back, right? They've inve invested a lot of time and energy uh, into their universities, but, but oftentimes don't have uh, spaces where they can actually thrive, where there's together togetherness, where there's community, where there's opportunities for expression, where there's even this sort of humanness uh, or human element associated with this. And so, you know, in higher education, we've been sort of using the term loosely uh, counter spaces, right? Counter spaces as a way for safety, as a way for validation, as a way to kind of strike up um, um, interests and conversations though, with those who have like minded um, um, interests. And so, the more I explored that, I felt as if counter spaces were so, sort of under theorized. Um, and there were so, sort of questions and gaps that, that, that exist in the concept of, of, of counter spaces. And so, you know, the more I read, uh, particularly during the pandemic and, and elsewhere, you know, I've really been drawn upon the work of sociologists, particularly uh, Marcus Hunter, who's done a lot of work, case studies um, around placemaking. And he explored an area of Chicago and tried to understand that uh, in spite of structural racism, how are black people kind of navigating that space and, and providing whether it's virtual spaces or physical spaces where they feel like there's a sense of belonging, a sense of community, a sense where they can express and even organize and mobilize, particularly during this sort of the after, this, this racial reckoning that we're facing um, in the aftermath of George Floyd and of, of course, countless other uh, bodies that have been uh, uh, murdered or, or killed by, by police officers or vigil vigilantes. And so, you know, I, I thought about placemaking, but also wanted to apply that to the campus environment, uh, particularly for non-Black campuses and how Black students we're engaging in these conversations. Conversations. They've always been poised. Um, they've always been intellectually curious to really think about how that they can disrupt structures and how are they organizing. Right um, on our own campus, we had a list of uh, of demands in the aftermath of George Floyd, saying that we want to we want our university to do better. Right, right. We have a gross underrepresentation of black faculty, black students, black staff members. We need to address that concern. We're not really confident and comfortable with our campus police, right? We need to do a better job of that conversation, whether it's sort of reimagining uh, campus policing. Um, that has been an issue that students, you know, in, in my own research are finding different ways to kind of uh, navigate that space to avoid, you know, folks that they feel um, uh, don't have their best interests. And so this term is really a way that I'm just naming its, its, its existence, right? Naming the sort of uh, behavioral patterns, the ways that students are strategically and intellectually engaging in a space where, where you know, even if they are rejecting this sort of broader academic community, they are finding virtual spaces, particularly during this public health um, um, crisis, they're, they're finding physical spaces where they can find opportunities just for self-care, right? Just to engage with each other, um, to serve as a research source, to lean on each other in times of needs, to think about how can they organize in ways that might disrupt some of these toxic structures that exist on their own campus or in their own communities, right? And so these are the kinds of things that, that I've been thinking about, um, always known that, that Black students have been courageous, have been thoughtful in the way in which they navigate these spaces, but it's certainly important for me as a researcher to kind of document that, to really understand that, to name it. 
And um, I've been building on this work. It's relatively new for me. I'm still exploring uh, some other avenues. And this piece that, that you referenced here, I'm really thinking about virtual spaces during a pandemic and how students, even though that, that we don't have open campus, are still engaging with each other and finding ways um, to disrupt these very toxic um, environments. That's dope. That's dope. And for folks watching or folks listening, we're going to link that piece underneath underneath this video or un underneath this podcast and um, several of several other pieces from from Dr. Como as well. Uh, Dr. Como, thank you so much for for gracing us with your presence and helping us explore this intersection between uh, college athletics and and racial justice and and just the the ongoing effort ongoing effort to to demolish white supremacy and to eradicate anti-blackness in our college campuses and, and throughout our education system. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here on All of the Above. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Love the work that you all are doing. Keep fighting the good fight. Of course, of course. All right, all right folks, up next is our class dismissed where we like to shout out folks doing wonderful things in the world of education. Stay tuned. All right, folks, we have reached that time in the episode where we like to give shout outs to folks doing wonderful things in the world of education. And Jeff, you know, um, you and I have, have been doing the show for, for a little while now, and there was a time where we noticed there, that there seemed to be a pattern of like the dope guests that we had on the show. After being on our show, something super dope would happen in their professional life. And, you know, whether it be, you know, promotions or 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 something of of, of that sort. And, you know, we we jokingly called it the AOTA bump because it seemed like appearing on our show led to, you know, a bit of a bump in that person's own uh, professional career aspirations or in what have you. And I think that we need to revisit that idea of a AOTA bump because um, I suspect some of our recent guests may have um, some good, exciting news for us to shout out. Yeah, man, I think uh, that is definitely true. Uh, we've done some preliminary examination of the data and uh, the correlation uh, is strong <laughs> enough that I think it even might be said to prove some measure of causation. Now, um, this is not a peer review a view peer reviewed study yet, yes. but it can be. Um, any doctoral students out there want to come, uh, you know, do the regression analysis for us, we can make that happen. But uh, I think it's fair to say um, there is an AOTA bump and we take full responsibility, Manuel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but all seriousness, um, you know, 2020 was a crap year. It just was. Um, but but there has been some some silver lining, man. Some of the AOTA bump has uh, has happened for some of our incredible dope guests, and and we've got some you know some shout outs, some good news to share about some of our amazing guests and things that happened to them uh, in 2020. So uh, we got we got some good stuff. All right, well let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's let's let's, let's start with um, you know the election was. It feels like a lifetime away, but um, you know the positive outcomes of the election are still, still um, upon us. So um, give us some news there. How how has the AOTA bump showed up in this uh, election cycle? Yeah, man. Well, a couple of noteworthy outcomes. One is, uh, of course, a recent guest here on All the Above and my uh, former colleague uh, here in Los Angeles, Tanya Ortiz Franklin, uh, was just recently in December sworn in as the newest member of the Los Angeles Unified uh, School District Board of Education, representing uh, District 7. So uh, congrats to Tanya, who, uh, you know, of course, has, has been on All the Above twice now. Um, and we'll uh, hopefully have her back again. Um, we also, as we mentioned um, last week on, on the podcast, on our passing period, uh, or a couple weeks ago on, on a passing period, a um, uh, member of the AOTA show family, uh, one of the big supporters of the show, Brian Tabatabai, educator from uh, the West Covina area um, in California, was elected um, to the city council out there. So uh, fantastic shout out to him and props for uh, bringing educator voice in the halls of power. Um, but that's that's not it, Manuel. We've got some others. There's more. Uh, do you want to name you want to name a couple? 
Well, you know, I I believe that in the realm of of writing and publishing work, we've had some recent guests who um, are doing big things there. And you know, when this pandemic first like hit the states, and we moved to having a socially distanced production of AOTA show. One of our early guests during that time who who joined us to speak about uh, school leadership in the wake of COVID-19 um, was, of course, Principal Kafele. And during that discussion, he talked about an upcoming book that he was writing um, called The uh, Assistant Principal 50, where he was going to explore and, and, and discuss some of the leadership qualities and um, aspects of being an assistant principal. The book was not available yet at the time. He was still finishing it up. And um, I believe, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that, that book has not only been published, but it has climbed the the rankings of the um, sales list for, for which organization was it? I think uh, ASCD? This is for ASCD, yes. ASCD bestseller. Um, and that, that happened in December. So uh, props and shout out to Principal Kafele for that. He, he also, Manuel, I will say, for those who subscribe to ASCD and get um, the magazine Educational Leadership, had an article published in the December issue of Ed Leadership. So um, I think we might call that a double AOTA show bump. <laughs> Wow. Now there, there, there can't be any other AOTA show bump news for, for today. I mean, that's already quite a bit. Ed, it's an impressive track record, Manuel, but the list does not end there. Uh, we would be remiss to not talk about um, a former guest on the show, Principal Eamon Ra, um, who is just a, a fantastic, fantastic, dynamic leader of a high school in Watts, is publishing a new book um, written and, and uh, got to the finish line in 2020, but I think is going to roll over into publishing in, in here in early 2021. Um, but he's got a new book coming out entitled Revolutionary School Culture, The Six Principles of Unlocking Your School's Hidden Treasure. So shout out to him. And then, Manuel, we also had a recent guest on the show, Gerardo Munoz, co-host of the Two Dope Teachers uh, and a Mike podcast coming out of Denver, Colorado, along with Kevin Adams. He was named Colorado Teacher of the Year. So, you know, this is what I'm saying, man. The data is there on the AOTA bump, man. I well, mean, it's clear. It's just facts. It's clear. It's right there, you know? <laughs> facts don't care about your feelings or whatever uh, those, those folks like to say out science, there. Science, man. Science. Yes, man. <laughs> yes. All right. So shout out to all of them for sure. And um, shout out to all of our all of our AOTA family. This new year, new hopes, new aspirations, and of course, a lot of work to do to um, address address the, the craziness of 2020. So uh, you know, continue to to join us. We we love you. We appreciate you. If you haven't already, uh, give us that given us that thumbs up or that five star review. Uh, please consider doing that. We very much appreciate that. That goes a very long way. And folks, we hope that this is a fantastic year. For, for all of our AOTA family, and um, we'll be here with you throughout. All right, so that about does it for today's episode. See you next time.